afternoon. I'm Richard Digline, moderator for today's Compensation Committee webinar on using the powerful influence of compensation in your leadership strategy. I believe we all can agree that leadership strategy is critical to corporate success, but can be a difficult concept to implement, particularly when compared to business strategy. Pearl Meyer has done some interesting work in this area and will be sharing some concepts, metrics, and case studies on the subject. Today I'm joined by Bill Roskin, who currently serves as a member of the Compensation Committee for Sony Corporation of America, and Alap Shah, Managing Director in the New York office of Pearl Meyer. We're going to have a robust discussion about the role that compensation can play in furthering a company's leadership strategy and we look forward to getting the audience feedback through polling questions on your experiences in this area. Before we begin, Ronell Perry with NACD's education team has a few housekeeping announcements. Ronell? Thank you, Richard. Slides will be available early next week at the link on the screen, and you can download them right within this console. Additionally, you can submit a question and receive your answer directly from Perlmeyer today. If you do that, you will also be opted in to receive future executive compensation thought leadership from Perlmeyer. Remember, you can also tweet live with NACD and Perlmeyer. Please download the presentation and access additional resources right here within the console. This, your participation in today's webinar, automatically accrue one NACD skill credit can be applied to your NACD fellowship program. And if you have questions about the fellowship programs, please see the email address on the screen. Remember, the slides will be available early next week at nacdonline.org and perlmeyer.com. Alap, over to you. Thank you, Ronel. Uh, today we're going to focus our, our presentation on a subject that has in recent years become somewhat lost as a result of directors attempting to balance the need to shepherd management teams to deliver on quantifiable metrics aligned to business strategy objectives and shareholder expectations. That subject is the, is the people and how, how to properly structure compensation systems that can lead to better engagement. Most, multiple studies show that competitive pay is important but rarely a defining factor tying an executive to an organization. In fact, although compensation levels have increased, executive and employee engagement levels are at all-time lows. The implication is that compensation systems are wasting an opportunity by focusing more on value of the role and pay levels versus value of the individual and talent management. To begin, we thought it would be worthwhile to solicit your views on the following question. Are talent management and or leadership development formally discussed by the Compensation Committee? Please submit your answers. So um, the results should be posted on the screen, and um, it, it, it's a very, I think a very interesting result here, um, especially between the distinction between the yes and the yes, but needs to be more robust. Bill, Richard, any thoughts on the results or uh, or, the, or any experiences you have to share? Yeah. Um, I think it's clear that um, talent management is a responsibility of the compensation committee and of the board generally, uh, usually delegated to the comp committee, and is um, uh, allied with succession planning uh, in all its uh, various aspects. But um, enough uh, time is, is often um, lacking, and uh, boards don't really get an opportunity to concentrate on the development of the talent within the organization in an appropriate way. Um, developing a talent management book uh, for the board and making sure it's presented at, 
first at the compensation committee and then more generally, or the way I've done it, at an open compensation committee meeting in which I was happy to report that we had a number of uh, um, other board members attend, um, is a useful uh, a tool and a useful way to approach uh, the board getting an understanding of the talent within the organization, and it's an assumption that talent management and leadership development is indeed a compensation committee function. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I think there is one aspect that isn't always done very well in, in corporate America, and that is that there is really honest-to-goodness face time, both socially and in presentation format, with at least the C-suite, if not the next one or two levels down. So you don't just see a paper report. You don't just get a uh, view from the CEO or from the HR executive, but you literally can link a face and a conversation, and I think that enhances really uh, looking at that talent management and leadership. I agree, and I, I think it was the, there used to be a, a kind of a standard that uh, the day before a board meeting, uh, there'd be a board dinner, and often the senior uh, management would be invited to that board dinner for the very reason that you're uh, mentioning. Yep. Um, I'm not sure that's still as robust as it was uh, a few years back, but it's uh, certainly a very useful way to informally get to know the senior management of the group. Agree with you. In, in fact, I was just having this conversation with a, with, with a client uh, right before this um, webcast, and we're talking about how that company actually has a multi-pronged process in, in creating more exposure for the board to uh, with, with the senior leadership team. And so they make it a point to have senior leaders present um, on a rotating basis at least some subject matter at every board meeting. And in terms of um, you know, the, the social aspect, they actually have, have, have made it a point to do these um, these board dinners with some of the senior leadership team, and um, and and an interesting twist on that is with each course um, in the in a multi-course dinner, they actually are having the directors rotate tables, so they can have multiple you know encounters uh, uh, with with different members of the senior leadership team, and I thought that was a very uh, progressive um, uh, way to ensure that. The, the board members are actually putting uh, a face to the name. A uh, speed dating approach, but uh. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thankfully they're all or, uh, that, that they're all already hired, so <laughs> not, not too much uh, not, not not too much selection. Um, you know, but 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 one thing uh, on, on these results I just wanted to touch on uh, was the sort of the ten percent of the population that that indicated no, but many top topics touch on the issue. Um, I think that's absolutely correct. I, I, I do think many of the topics that are discussed in the in the committee do touch on uh, touch on an issue. Um, however, I, I think there needs to be more of a narrow, narrow focus on talent management and leadership development going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the the overall core of this presentation is 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 trying to get an understanding of how to link compensation strategy to leadership strategy and, in fact, make your compensation uh, systems more effective. So what this graphic shows on page 8 is uh, what, what I'll label on the left side, um, sort of the, the spectrum of practice that, that currently uh, occurs in uh, most of the organizations that at least I, I work with. So the current slash historic practice of designing compensation systems in the context of market practice, what your companies are doing, and the, the, the overall business objectives of, uh, of the organization. Oh, uh, then over on the right side of the spectrum is sort of this, um, what I'll say, emerging practice slash current practice of a, um, a, f um, a significant focus on making sure the compensation programs are aligned with the current uh, um, uh, needs and desires of the, sh of the sh of your shareholder base and, in sh and, and focusing in on the, the necessary accountability. Now, um, what we're recommending uh, companies um, do in terms of thinking about the next phase of compensation program design is to think about systems that um, are centered on engaging executives, um, and so the, therefore the, the, the recipients of these compensation uh, uh, program systems, and, and 
while maintaining an alignment on shareholders. Because by, by implementing uh, this type of construct in your program design, uh, I think what will happen is that the, the human element of compensation will no longer be lost, and you'll be designing uh, pay systems that are actually engaging and motivating to, to the population. I think the, the, the pendulum has shifted a little bit more um, uh, to focusing on the, the shareholder alignment and accountability, and this is where individuals and how um, uh, seeing if the compensation program is actually meeting their needs is, is, is getting lost. Yeah, I would, I would comment on this, that um, uh, employees feel engaged when they have line of sight to the impact that they're having. And um, when, when we are able to uh, develop a program uh, for executives that uh, indicate their responsibility to meet the strategic goals uh, that have been adopted by the board and presumably that uh, are shared by the shareholders, um, they have an opportunity to see the impact of what they're uh, being asked to do. And uh, as long as those programs are sufficiently um, directed towards them and their skill level and what they're expected to contribute, um, it leads to a more engaged and, I think, a more successful overall organization. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? To flush out the concept of how do you how do you truly go about balancing um, engagement and alignment, I want to drill down on on, on a few points here. Uh, so uh, under the the engagement centered uh, uh, focus, uh, we, we, the three sub bullets um, uh, really adhere to ma making sure the compensation program design has the following principles. Be attentive to the current and evolving needs. What that basically means is what you want to have is a, a compensation program that allows for the ability uh, for the program to evolve, not only with your business, but also your population. For example, um, have a client that has a, um, a, a demographic, an executive population demographic that is now shifting closer to retirement age. In the past, they've had equity compensation uh, vest on a four-year basis, and that four-year basis wasn't ratable 25% each year, but was uh, back-loaded vesting. So now as the executive team is now nearing and approaching retirement, um, there are significant concerns whether it continues to make sense to have a back-loaded four-year vest structure on their equity awards, or should, you know, should a shorter time frame be um, uh, uh, allowed and implemented, or should you have some uh, other provisions in place that happens on a qualified retirement that allows individuals not to lose a particular value. And, um, but to balance that, the, an engagement-centered uh, compensation design also incorporates a, incorporates a true long-term uh, focus on compensation that extends beyond three years. Uh, as, as, you're, as you're all very much aware, the, the vast majority of performance share programs have a three-year uh, time frame in terms of assessing performance against whatever metric you select. Now, the reason for that is really the focus has been on forecasting business results um, or, or operational, um, uh, operation, operational results rather than developing talent. So I believe if you have components in your compensation program that have a longer term view um, of performance, and you, you would end up having a, a much more engaged um, executive team. Any comments on that, uh, uh, Bill or Richard? Yeah, Lop, uh, one of the things that comes to mind as you were speaking in this area that so many companies have developed a metrics that has to do with TSR, total shareholder return, and, and very often on a three-year horizon. And my personal view of that is that that is a really bad practice. Uh, I like total shareholder return, but I like to see it on a five to seven year cycle. And one of the ways that I've had an experience in using it successfully was to literally use restricted stock units uh, so the executive that receives them doesn't end up with a taxable event and to have restrictions on them so they cannot be sold until that executive actually leaves or retires. 
So if you have a restricted stock unit and it's granted to you on a really long-term kind of a basis, um, you obviously are aligned in terms of trying to drive shareholder value. The other part uh, that I think is important is that we really ought to go back to some of the old-fashioned metrics, uh, you know, like return on to total capital employed, you know, free cash flow, things like that, and to use some of those as metrics for performance and measurement. Yeah, um, let me say that I, I, I don't like using a total shareholder return uh, personally as, a, as an end uh, uh, goal in itself. To me, that's the result of good programs um, that the shareholders have bought into by continuing to be shareholders as they understand the strategy of the organization and move forward and um, as as you have success um, then the shareholders reap the benefit of that uh, through uh, probably enhanced stock price or maybe through dividends etc whatever is appropriate um, but to me that's not a strategy in itself uh, uh, it is the outcome of a good strategy and the outcome of uh, a good program um, I also uh, find it, uh, would find it in many of the companies I've been involved with to have long-term programs that um, are successful over, the, over more than three years. Not that I don't have more than con uh, three years in the number of employment agreements, I do, um, but the, the thought of, um, of planning out that five-year period, given the ups and downs and changes, the uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, the restructurings that go on, uh, all of them make uh, make the longer term programs more difficult to um, use as um, as good leverage for engaging employees for that long period of time. I think where you can do it, where you can do it, you should do it. Um, but I think you need to be careful in in relation to that. I think you can use also some long term uh, specific kind of goals that you're trying to reach that are maybe five years out or so on, and if they are reached within that time frame, there is a potential cash payout uh, versus a stock payout. Uh, there's a question that's come in from the audience that ties right in here. Does the long-term compensation timeline vary by industry? Do you see any significant industry differences, for example, as in industries with high M&A activity? technology industries. And, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, what we are seeing um, is a pretty significant difference in, in the in the technology space uh, in terms of uh, having compensation programs and long-term compensation programs focused on a longer time frame. Uh, you, you see that less so in uh, retail establishments where you, um, the retail industry, uh, we're seeing more year performance programs or even one-year, quote-unquote, long-term performance programs. Um, but in the technology space, you are seeing things are, you know, five, seven years out. Absolutely. Yeah, and the, the question that's is, come is, in is interesting, Bill. It was really directed to you uh, personally. Considering the global remuneration challenges of the Sony Corporation, what has been your experience with global businesses remunerating, remunerating executives in markets all around the globe. Well, I had uh, actually a lot of experience with that at Viacom, um, where we had uh, a global uh, and Viacom slash CBS, uh, where we had uh, a global uh, uh, outposts uh, throughout, uh, really throughout the world, uh, and in emerging markets. Um, you, there are there are differences when you get to very specific issues. Uh, for example, in certain countries, uh, stock options um, are not uh, uh, considered a very very um, good way to uh, reward employees because they have an initial taxable event, uh, which discourages people from really wanting to get them, um, and they look for alternative type of rewards. In those conditions, I try and develop more uh, what you were just referring to, milestone targets, which would result in some cash awards on hitting the milestones. Um, and part of them are directed towards how the company does overall and part directed on how they do in their specific location. Um, and uh, obviously that the amount of compensation is reflective of the economy they're in and the uh, levels of what's considered appropriate good compensation in those countries. 
So there's lots that goes on um, in all of these areas. And of course, at the end of a period of time when you're, um, when you're looking at, uh, finally looking at the rewards that are going to be occurring, you often get, well, what about foreign currency transactions? And what, are you going to, what about FX uh, issues that uh, either value or devalue uh, what has occurred in some respects? So these are issues that occur both at Sony and they occur, frankly, uh, every place where large companies have uh, uh, a global footprint. And I think all those issues are ones that need to be looked at. And looked at, though, with the prism um, that we're talking about today of engaging the employees and seeing to it that they understand the strategy of the company, that they understand what their uh, direction is, what, their, what they will be rewarded for, which is why, as Richard just mentioned, some of the points of milestone rewards are are very important to develop. And whether that can be done on a three-year horizon or a five-year horizon does depend in part on industry, and it depends in part also on what's happening in, that, in the countries uh, involved. So there are some, some differences that are cultural and some differences that um, need to be considered. But always, I think, if we keep our focus on engaging the employee, engaging the executive, making sure that they're aligned with what we are trying to do on a global basis, uh, we will have success. I, a question that came in that's very interesting, Bill, uh, and a lot on TSRs, uh, based on some comments I made and then some that you made, Bill. Uh, this party says, I'm a little confused. Why not use TSR if it is an outcome of good strategy? Well, TSR is exactly that. If you want, what you want, in my view, TSR is, is the outcome, um, yes. not not the strategy itself. What you want to do is, is, the, is have strategies that will reward the people who have invested in your company by owning stock in it, um, and by doing that in, in a way by meeting your strategic objectives, by uh, exceeding them where possible, by developing new markets, and doing all of those things that a growing company does. And if you're successful in focusing the attention on those, the executive's attention on those things, meeting the business objectives and the strategy, TSR will follow. It will be the result. Uh, but I, I don't reward uh, executives. I wouldn't advise rewarding executives solely on the fact that they've uh, had some total shareholder return that is, uh, that is positive, particularly where there's so many in this world um, events that are outside of the control of these executives you know they work hard they're meeting their targets um they they they've engaged their group and uh the stock tanks because of some uh terrible episode that happens uh overseas um or some other event unrelated to anything to do with their business um and so yeah, there's too much psychological and and nuance to the stock market and to the pricing of the shares that are in that market. Uh, I agree with what you just said. I think it, it's more like I'd use the analogy. Uh, your TSR is sort of like your grade report card out of college. You know, you get A's if you really do all of the real good work, but if you don't do it, you don't. TSR is nothing more than what you've already said, Bill. It's, it's that you did perform and did deliver what the expectations were, and it reflected in the price. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and frankly, it's, it, it's double dipping. You know, if you're getting equity compensation, that's already linked to stock price. So, you know, why not have performance metrics that actually result in uh, in, in, in stock appreciation? So. Another good point, yes. Um, so uh, just a few quick, quick points before we move off to the slide on uh, what it means to have a sort of an alignment-centered program is that you, you want to make sure you're using compensation elements in the most efficient manner to unlock value creation. So a quick example of that is if you have individuals that have significant equity ownership uh, within the organization, you, know, re you really need to think and examine whether it continues to make sense to reward them annually in equity compensation, um, or is there a, some value creation opportunity in shifting them to a, um, a cash-based long-term program. Um, in terms of making equi um, delivering equ equitable payouts with upside and downside, this, this is really a comment about examining your leverage curves 
and um, you know, most organizations like to see a uh, like to see a symmetrical leverage curve where um, you're getting a, a similar payout as a percent of target at threshold as you're getting on the downside as you're getting on the upside um, with, with for your max payout. Um, I think you know what I would advise here is that don't be afraid to. Uh, look at asymmetrical leverage curves because that may be more reflective of your your you know, particular point in your in your business cycle and what your employees um, uh, and how your employees need to be compensated. And then the last point um, is really about outreach, and it's, it's zeroing in on the point of listen during your outreach. Uh, it should be less about um, talking and explaining your programs and more about listening uh, to what are the, the true shareholder concerns while blocking out the, the white noise, if you will, that are provided by uh, many proxy advisory firms. So if we could uh, move on to the, the next slide, and we'll get into – in you know what it means that you know in practice, how do you compensate the individual and not just the role? So if you look at the graphic on page ten, you'll see the the the, the, the blue boxes on on top, which defines the the current process, the high level process of how pay is actually established and then ultimately determined. Where you define a role, you select a benchmark, you use your compensation philosophy to establish what the appropriate target pay is, and then you, and, and, and you select uh, appropriate performance criteria to assess uh, assess performance, and then uh, and finally determine an actual payout. Um, what a compensation program system that focuses more on the uh, the individual uh, rather than compensating the role. What we would add to that is uh, uh, initiate leadership diagnostics for each of your uh, senior executives and to truly understand what drives them from a, a personality uh, basis, from a cultural basis, to see and, and to determine how that aligns with your overall organizational structure. Um, under selecting benchmarks, um, add to that process a, a concept where you're really looking at the benchmark uh, data through the prism of the diagnostic. So the, the example I, I would share there is that to, uh, say you have a CFO um, that has been promoted through the organization and, um, and the, the leadership diagnostic indicates that they are sort of say 60% of the way there in, term, in terms of being a full-fledged CFO, full-fledged individual uh, member of the C-suite uh, in terms of what you need from a strategic pr perspective. Does it make sense to compensate them at um, the same market percentile uh, pay philosophy as another, uh, take your you know, chief, uh, chief technology officer who is a fully functioning chief technology officer and completely uh, has the right skill set uh, for, uh, that's needed for for your C-suite. Uh, does it make sense to uh, to compensate them at the at the same market percentiles, or should there be some uh, differentiation that occurs? Um, the the use of philosophy to establish target pay. Here, what we would add here, and this is a bit of a controversial uh, subject, um, and I know Bill, you you have some thoughts on this, but. Um, Consider the uh, allowing for limited program design choice in your compensation uh, program. So what that basically means is that um, if the needs of the um, executive are a focus on having a different pay mix than what is espoused by the compensation philosophy, so maybe um, a little bit more in long-term compensation and a little less in short-term compensation than what is the, the actual compensation uh, program structure, um, allow for executives to have some choice in that matter. I think that would increase engagement and, and truly customize the compensation program um, for the individual that you have with, within the role. And I'll just pause there, Bill, and I know you want to uh, maybe jump in here on some thoughts. Um, well, I, I think it's, uh, it's practical if you have 50 employees. Uh, I think uh, once you get to 50,000 or 10,000 or several thousand and therefore a number of executives involved, it becomes very tricky to do this type of, uh, of uh, thing that you, you discussed. First of all, it creates a, a huge burden on appropriate administration, which becomes very important um, uh, because once you promise something, you want to make sure you can deliver it. Um, and um, 
you would never, for example, I shouldn't say you would never, I would never uh, allow people to increase their base salary on that basis. You know, I'd like a little more base salary, I'll take a little less in bonus. Um, I would restrict that. Um, if you're doing anything like this, it would be for people who say, you know, I'd take a little more long-term and a little less on my on my annual bonus, but you'll find a very rare individual in that case. Um, although you might find that if somebody, in the example you talked about before, is closing to retirement age, um, and there where it may make some sense for him to say, look, I have so much stock um, backed up here. Is there any way I can move a little bit of uh, the total direct comp into my immediate comp on uh, the annual program? And there you might want to uh, take a look at that. But it, to try and do that systematically and to give uh, hundreds or maybe even thousands of employees this kind of opportunity, I think, would wreak havoc with your, your program and become um, just not efficient enough to, to uh, make sense to do it. I really agree with that, Bill. In a, in a very large environment, I think it's extremely difficult and would take an enormous amount of administrative, you know, involvement. Uh, there's an interesting question that ties to a couple of your blocks here, though. A lot that, uh, uh, just for some clarification, are there leadership diagnostics that you recommend or find particularly effective? Um. Yes, um, there, there are many organizations uh, do uh, sort of Myers Briggs types of assessments, um, and or there's um, the Five Forces personality um, uh, 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 tests, and what that does is is assesses the 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 leadership traits that an organization wants and marries that with the leadership traits that your individual C-suite members have. What, what I think you need to do is um, have a, 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 um, a program structure that, that makes sure that you have alignment with, with both and then figuring out where you have, where you have those particular goals. A couple of uh, uh, instruments that I have found over the years to be extremely uh, helpful in this whole uh, diagnostic thing is one called DISC, D-I-S-C, uh, PPS, uh, Personal Profile System. It's a personal profile system. It talks, gives you royal role behavior analysis, can compare multiple people. So what it essentially, it's not a psychological thing. It is essentially, as you go through it, it literally highlights how you as an individual like to communicate how you like people to communicate to you. And then if you do this in a transparent way and everybody does the assessment, then you share it so you see how all of you, in fact, like to receive and give communication, both in stress positions, conflict, uh, and reward. Uh, the other one that I think from an individual perspective that I think is very helpful is uh, called the, the VIA dash IS survey, VIA survey, it literally takes you through and identifies your character strengths so you get to understand the various components of your own personality profile. Uh, do you have a great sense of humor? Are you risk averse? Are you risk prone, et cetera, et cetera? Those are two that I found very useful. I, I can only comment that uh, most of the executives I dealt with are characters in their own right. Um, I don't think that uh, a lot of them would uh, sit for uh, this kind of diagnostic, and certainly not Myers-Briggs or anything like that. The DISC is possible, um, but a lot of them just uh, really resent uh, having achieved uh, a lifetime of uh, success that brought them to a C-suite or to brought them to an executive vice president level in an organization to all of a sudden taking what they would call a psychological test or a psych test. And, um, and, and in fact, uh, I, I just know in, in companies that have talked about it that it's been, re in the entertainment world, it's been widely rejected. Um, not to say that there aren't some appropriate elements for it. What I've used instead of that kind of thing is individual coaching. Um, it's a little more expensive, and I do it on a, on a particular basis, but I've used individual coaches uh, where we see someone has um, clear potential. 
but it's being obscured by some uh, dram dramatics in his uh, presentation and his approach. Um, and we'd really like to lose the bad and keep the good. Um, and there I have found success with individual coaching. But a standard yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I'm sorry, bottom, yeah. I, I think the bottom line is, is that um, this is something that is very tuned in to the culture of the organization. And what you want to do is make sure you have an assessment mechanism that is meaning that, that makes sense within your organizational construct. So whether that is uh, leadership coaching, whether that is um, some uh, formal you know, diagnostic, whether that is engagement surveys, um, I, I, I think what the board should do is figure out with the management team what would be most effective and, and bring that to the table in terms of developing a compensation program. Because what is happening is that we are developing these programs in a bit of a vacuum. And that is that is leading to unintended consequences. Okay. Uh, if we go, go to the next slide, I think we're uh, teeing up for a uh, an, another couple of polling questions. How many companies currently evaluate their human capital uh, through either engagement surveys, cultural diagnostics, or leadership personality profiles? If you could submit your answers there. And we're going to digest, uh, there's, there's two questions that are going to be teed up here, so we're going to digest the results on both at the same time. So if a value, uh, and and so as you are you submitting the the responses, what you want to make sh uh, sure to understand it is whether or not you think it's appropriate to do these on an annual basis or a periodic basis, um, uh, things like that. And it sounds like Bill, you, you've you've tried to use some of these types of programs, but they just haven't worked in the in your particular environment. Yeah, uh, I've used, uh, actually I've done overall uh, engagement surveys for thousands of employees at a time. Um, and uh, I find them to be very useful, um, not only just for your most senior C-suite people, but to get a good sense of what's going on in the organization as a whole, which I think is very important for the board to get a sense of as well. Um, and there are different ways it just comes to light, uh, but a good survey uh, well done where people understand that it's not personally threatening to them, that we're looking for them to give honest feedback, um, is it's helpful to get a sense of what's happening in the overall organization. And I've used that um, in different ways at different places, but all with the same kind of uh, feedback that we're looking to get. Um, and it, it does, it, and it, what's important is when you get those results is to pay attention to them uh, and to address them and to let the employee group know that they're being addressed um, and that uh, what the results were. Uh, for the most senior group, um, I've also used these kinds of things in a different context, not, not a testing type context, but uh, all kinds of focus group things that um, in relation to, let's say, new product design or something like that where um, in another industry where um, the, the team focus became very important and we spent some time talking about team building and team approach and being um, out there uh, making sure that the shy person got his point of view across as well as the person who is usually uh, on top. So it looks like the, the results indicate that most, uh, most directors are, are, are exposed to using the, uh, these types of assessment mechanisms uh, in dealing with the, uh, the, the, the companies that they're working with. And you know, the, the, the obvious next question that, that we'll tee up right now is that um, if you are doing these evaluations, what extent do the results factor into the compensation design? And you know, I think this is really the key issue here is that once you do those assessments, what are you actually doing with the information? Now, it's important to use that inf information to um, cultivate the culture that you want at an organization, uh, cultivate the individuals that you want to be your future leaders, but are you actually using those results to formally uh, inform the compensation program design? So I think you maybe have had a chance to submit your responses uh, to this, and uh, do we have the results yet? So uh, inter in interestingly enough, uh, there seems to be 
uh, you know, either no discernible relationship or serves as a context as being the sort of the two more po uh, two more uh, most popular results outside the NA. And I, frankly, I'm not surprised by that. And I, what I do think should happen is that we need to have these assessment mechanisms. Um, more directly inform the compensation design. So if you go to the next uh, the next slide, um, this is um, a bit of a case study on how you use some of those engagement uh, surveys or leadership profiles to inform the uh, the actual compensation program design. So on the left side of uh, the page here, what you have is an executive profile um, that is. Um, um, that was constructed from one of the leadership diagnostic surveys. Um, ability to take prudent risk, does well in uncertain situations, thrives in a decentralized environment, empowers employees, acknowledges and learns from mistakes, desires career advancement and expanded role. Um, and as you can see from the, what we're trying to do on the right side of the page is how do these uh, personality pro profile characteristics, how do they translate into an effective compensation design? So what you want to you know, for this type of profile, uh, you want to make sure you emphasize leverage and risk reward. Uh, you want to prioritize lead me uh, metrics um, over lag metrics. So something like total shareholder return definitely would not make sense uh, for for, the, for this type of individual. You, uh, you want to focus on re recognition um, over over retention. This is a, a very uh, performance oriented type of uh, individual. That's how they're that's how they're keyed. Um, they they want to coach people as opposed uh, you know as as opposed to really being a manager. So they. they uh, they, 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 it would be more important to uh, recognize those types of accomplishments in, in, in their development of their people. Uh, implementing team-based features, um, allowing for discretion versus a pure formulaic design, and um, really the need for significant long-term compensation because they're looking at this as a career uh, rather than uh, just a um, you know continue to expand expand their role. Alap, can you, uh, a question from one of our participants, could you please contrast the compensation program structures for leadership development in private versus public entities? Do you see a difference? I, I would say absolutely not. Um, the, now, there are some role-specific uh, distinctions that you want to make between private and 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 public um, organizations, uh, just based on job tasks. But in terms of the personality um, profile, I think in today's sort of you know nonprofit private environment, you have the same engaged, uh, you know, needing to be engaged, hard driving, hard hard hard, hard working executives now um, that are populating the executive ranks of those types of organizations as you have in, in the public environment. What we're talking here about is really, you know, nu nuanced differences. So potentially in a nonprofit or private environment, a recognition might be a lot more important than actual compensation level, uh, being sort of leaders in community uh, and, and having programs that are centered around that might actually uh, make more of a uh, make more of a difference to executives that are populating those types of companies. But I think generally the the, the profiles uh, tend to be rather consistent. It's really seeing do the profiles align with the culture of the organization. I agree with that. And so I, I think yes, that's I the main too. difference, not, not, not whether it's private or public. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So if we could go to the next uh, polling question. Um, Annual performance metrics for senior executives should be corporate financial metric driven, corporate financial and corporate milestones, corporate financial metrics and metrics specific to the role uh, and the individual, or all three. And the, I think what is happening in today's environment is there is a significant acceptance that the, the C-suite or even the senior uh, leadership team should be compensated on really corporate financial metrics only. 
uh, there is a sense that corporate milestones, you know, t t t can be, you know, can be subjective if not, pro you know, properly structured. And then compensating based on individual uh, MBOs or, you know, KPIs uh, tend to be um, also fall into the same categories of milestones. Tend to, tend to be potentially more qualitative and less, you know, quant quantitative. So it'd be interesting to see the results here. So all, uh, so all three, overwhelming majority for all three, financial, milestone, and, 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 and individual. Um, now, we have the same question teed up, and we'll go through it fairly quickly, on the, the long-term performance. We could just go um, to that particular question. Uh, long-term performance metrics for senior executives, she, the only real difference here is the introduction of a total shareholder return as as one of the sort of corporate uh, corporate metrics. So it'll be interesting to see if we have similar results as in terms of the long term, because what you you do tend to find is, generally speaking, less individual goals uh, in long term programs. So do we have the results for that yet? And so, not not not, not surprising. Uh, you see, the, the the prevalence under the all three scenario uh, shifted down considerably to about 47 percent. And what we have is a close second is uh, uh, the corporate financial and 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 corporate and corporate milestones. The and and, and so what this actually shows is a, a pretty stark contrast to the results that we have on the second on the next page. And I'll just briefly walk you, through, you know, walk you through the graph, and I, you know, I'd love to invite sort of commentary from Bill and Richard here. Is that the in, in a look at companies between uh, one billion and five billion? Um, uh, we didn't cut this by industry, but cut it by revenue size. We see a significant decline in the use of um, individual performance metrics uh, in the annual incentive program. Um, basically, you know, around 25% in 2010. Um, had some element of individual performance versus in 2016, where you're around 13, uh, 14 percent. So really, just you know, they're uh, cut in half. And I think the the the, the reason for this um, um, is is really for um, a push from proxy advisory firms and even some you know, institutional shareholders to have more formulaic um, uh, compensation programs. Uh, but you know, an interesting uh, question that I've heard. Um, you know, from directors and commentary from directors is, has, and I put it pose it as a question to both you, uh, Bill and Richard, is that many directors say that it's just easier to administer compensation programs if all the metrics are 100% formulaic. Um, so I'd like to you know, sort of get your commentary. Well, that, that. But obviously it is easier. <laughs> that doesn't mean that it's very effective. I remember a lot of years ago now, uh, we always had all of our senior executives, division executives, general managers, et cetera, they not only would have the standard corporate metrics that they had to address and try and, and, and execute on, but they had personal uh, literally personal areas that they were responsible for performing and fulfilling. And it might have been personal, a personal development thing. It might have been something about uh, turnover in their area. It could have been all a number of things. Uh, and, yeah, they're not as quantifiable. Uh, they're not as numeric. Uh, and I, I can't help but just share back a lot of years when I was with W.R. Grace, Peter Grace used to send out this little thing. Everybody had it. Uh, the executives had to have it under desk. If it doesn't count, if you can't count it, it doesn't count. And he meant literally, numerically. I think that's a terrible way to evaluate people, especially. Right. Well, I, I agree, and uh, I have used uh, uh, even uh, as recently as last year. Um, of the um, individual uh, KPIs uh, that were important to the organization at the very highest level um, in order to uh, make sure we had not only the, the metrics uh, performing, but that we were looking to achieve in an annual program the long-term 
uh, design that we had, the long-term strategy. And so in both the long-term and the short-term, we had milestones. Uh, hopefully, we properly designed the milestones in the annual that they were supportive of what the ultimate long-term was supposed to be. Um, and and we went forward with those. With those. Um, just looking at numbers, I think, is a reflex reaction to – uh, some bad publicity where some companies uh, that didn't do well, the people uh, got, uh, the senior execs got uh, good payouts because they achieved some uh, performance objectives uh, within their um, personalized uh, performance uh, standards. Um, and so the criticism came, you know, your company did poorly and look at the money this guy got. Um, right. And, and I don't think you should be afraid of that if what you designed you still believed was appropriate and his meeting those was appropriate, notwithstanding that uh, there was a failure someplace along the line. Um, obviously, he's not going to get 100%, but he still could get a reward based on the fact that he met what the board thought were appropriate standards uh, when it was designed. And the key is, of course, and one of the hardest things in compensation is designing appropriate performance standards. But I don't think because it's hard that you shy away from it. Yeah, and and in this, if you can key on to the next slide, you know, I I I 100% agree. And this this trend that is occurring that is reducing the prominence of um, having individual performance metrics in in compensation programs is, is frankly disturbing to me. And so we have we have on page uh, 15. Before we go there, let me just sure. make one comment that is coming out of our our uh, participants says, I would put leadership skills and conformance to culture to be in the individual metric category. Isn't this often the reason the CEO is let go? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would agree. Uh, I do too. I would agree with that 100. percent And I, and I think it, it is absolutely uh, correct that those should take a prominent place in, the, in those individual performance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and so what you know what we have on page 15 is um, a, a format uh, for uh, directors to be able to be. Uh, able to combat any sort of criticism that these individual performance metrics are you know, overly subjective. Is that if you if you select metrics that have uh, that adhere to the sort of the, the, the following principles on this page, uh, uh, measurable and manageable, um, have them be leveraged, not binary. So that doesn't mean okay, you know, so and so did a great job, so therefore they get a hundred percent payout. Um, uh, but ra you know, uh, say you know, what does that mean in terms of assess that great job and then give them a leverage payout uh, similar to you would on a financial uh, performance metric. Um, align the roles with the expected contribution to achieving uh, uh, business results. But uh, have it be reflective of the current business environment. And it can't tell you how many conversations I've had where we will get a um, outcome, payout outcome, where in the, if all the financial goals and the, the operational goals were completely missed by the organization, but the individual performance factor comes out as 100% achieved. That now, there may be instances in a, during a company's business cycle that that may be appropriate, um, but if that happens more often than it should, that is a problem with probably goal setting as as well as the performance management system that is in place with the organization. So directors should be quite skeptical of outcomes, uh, uh, pay outcomes that are ba uh, based on those types of results. So a lot, uh, another question from a participant. If personnel, if personal objectives are included, what are the best practices for the board in setting these kinds of personal objectives? I, I, I'm not I, sure I understand the question. All right, personal objectives, if you're going to include them, right. what is the best practice or practices for the board as you set these personal objectives? I, I, I well, think they, they have to be aligned. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you no, want no, to, go, go, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'd say they have to be aligned with the, with the corporate strategy. So let's, uh, let's assume, for example, that your strategy is to open up some international markets um, that have hitherto uh, not been opened. Um, that let's, so let's even to the CEO. The CEO gets as part of his um, discretionary uh, uh, P 
piece a, a specific uh, uh, goal or a specific milestone to hit in his annual plan or maybe a long-term plan as well uh, to move forward and opening up uh, into areas that haven't been opened before or to uh, another one is to improve the margins over a, a three-year period starting in, in year one. Um, put more emphasis on margin thing. They're specific to the ultimate strategy of the company leading to success, and so they aren't um, too soft. They are kind of specific. Um, developing your staff, yeah, that's a little bit sometimes harder to get to, but you certainly could put that um, on the goals. I don't know about the CEO as much as I would on the people under him, his direct reports. Developing the staff, I guess the CEO should be certainly um, developing people within the organization who can move up the level, up the ranks, but uh, right. and, just and, do that as personally. Yep. And, and, you know, I, I think you know, sort of aligning to that business strategy um, and then the, the, you know, uh, the, the other items that are on that page 15 of the deck, I think those tend to be the, the best practices of, of of defining what those metrics should be, but I think the one that is by far uh, the, the the most important is the first bullet on the on that on the on the on, on the page, which is the me whatever metrics you choose, they should be measurable and they should be manageable, and, right. and because the board needs to be able to make distinctions between individuals within the organization, regardless of what those individual metrics are per individual. Okay. And and these aren't going to be the whole ball game. I mean it's. Um, I, I, I think when we talk about these individual metrics, it's, it's for a portion of the award, whether it's the short-term or long-term award, because um, you still need to perform, um, and the overall metrics will, will probably uh, be the should be, in my view, the majority of the report card, so to speak. But these elements are very important to include um, in, in all of the senior executives' um, targets uh, for the year. And for the for the three or five year period, also. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, this is the last slide in the uh, formal presentation, and we've listed here is just some key takeaways. But um, by, but the main point he, here is that what what I think as we enter into the new compensation cycle uh, of uh, for 2017, I ask uh, board members to take a look at the compensation programs and, and truly try to ask the question of, does this compensation program engage the individuals it is supposed to cover? Could we do a better job at ensuring that there is engagement on a, on a go-forward basis um, uh, rather than just alignment to market practices or, or, or fear um, uh, uh, pro, uh, concerns on program design? Thank you very much uh, uh, for listening today. And if we still have a few more minutes, we could go to questions, but I'm not sure if we do. I think we have a few more, and I do have some uh, questions that are that are uh, up. And uh, let me go to the first one. Uh, are aggressive minimum stockholding requirements for senior executives an effective tool for driving long-term value focus? I think I'm not sure about the, the I think it's a value judgment in terms of what is aggressive. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but, but, but I think having meaningful stock ownership um, guidelines um, is an expectation uh, that you should have as being a C-suite type of individual. Uh, you're, you're, you're meant to be at the organization, regardless of what tenure stats uh, indicate, you're meant to be at the organization on a long-term basis, and therefore your compensation should be aligned in that fashion. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Next question. Uh, why does the CEO or senior leaders, why do they think they cannot take or don't need to take personality tests if they're making their other executives do that? Are they better than the employees that they often demand this of when hiring? I'm not well, sure that the senior executives that uh, didn't want to take those kinds of tests would want anybody to take those kinds of tests. I'm not sure that the question presumes that everybody else is taking them and they didn't. No, mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's not appropriate, and I don't think in, in, in the examples that uh, I was giving, I wasn't providing that example at all. Yeah, I, I think when you were talking about it, sort of, you know, the, the C-suite as a whole deciding. Right. But 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 frankly, you know, my view on that is that. 
what you want to make sure you do, I and mean, I think those tests are important to take, and I think they, they sort of uh, align with assessing do you have the right people in the right role with the, and do those individuals align with the culture of your, of your organization? So, you know, having those assessment mechanisms, doing that, I don't think does any damage. I agree with that. I think we may be just about out of time. Uh, Ronell, would you like to take us from here? Sure. Thank you, Richard. Audience, please do not miss our next webinar in the compensation series. Join NACD and Pearl Meyer for our next Compensation Series webinar on November 10, 2016. Registration is now open. NA NACD Fellows, remember, today your participation counts for one skill credit. If you'd like in more information on the fellowship program, contact Megan Metzbauer, Senior Fellowship Program Manager, as the information on the screen. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, Pearl Meyer.